we will go straight um, to the next uh, session, which is um, going to be taken by Stuart Hamilton. So Stuart, I hand over to you right away. Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Rotimi, for this Rotimi for this opportunity uh, to to speak to your group and thoroughly enjoyed the last presentation. I'm going to be taking up uh, taking about 40 minutes, 45 minutes to speak about leadership and management, and I'm just going to share my screen. So I hope that this works well. I think I need to be made a host. Am I right? Should be able to do that now. I'll try this, see if it works. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes, we can see your screen. Great, that's fine. Thank you very much then. So I'll just start from the beginning. Uh, here we go. Great, good. Well, um, Rotimi has asked me to speak to you today about practical commercial leadership and management. <clears throat> so a little bit about me, uh, not much. Uh, my name is Stuart Hamilton. I'm the director of Breakthrough Scotland Limited, which is based near Glasgow. Um, I have been running this company for a number of years. It's a, a business consultancy, which focuses on leadership and management training and input. Um, I, 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 one of my clients actually um, is the Scottish Chambers of Commerce. I'm, I don't work for them as an employee, but I'm contracted to them to head up their international trade division. And that has been a very interesting leadership and management experience for me because two years ago, uh, we had to set up a programme of international trade missions, which were being funded by the Scottish government. So there was a great deal of leadership involved in that, in launching the programme and convincing the Scottish government that they should fund it. And since then, since the programme started in 20, uh, 2020, actually, uh, sorry, 2019, I beg your pardon, um, we've had to manage it and make sure that the expectations of the chief executives of all the 30 chambers of commerce throughout Scotland are met because they are the ones who, lead, who take these missions. So there's quite a big management exercise in that. Now, the reason I mention that is because it's commonly the case when we have training companies that that's all they do. But I think it's very valuable to um, be able to deliver leadership and management training, but also be practicing it as well in a, in a real environment at the same time. So it doesn't just become theory and it becomes, it becomes practice. So what we're going to be looking at today um, in the short time that we have available is an overview only of the practical commercial leadership program, which is delivered uh, on three levels. And I'll spend a bit more time looking at these later. But essentially, all I'm trying to do at this stage is to, it's, it's a huge subject, it really is a huge subject. And I'm only trying to plant some thoughts in your mind that you may decide that you want to follow up on later on. Uh, so this is just very much a high level overview of the three levels uh, of, of uh, modules that we, we deliver, the executive, the manager and the leader. Now, leadership and management are not exactly the same thing. There are some similarities, but there are some traits that, that, that managers have that leaders don't have and vice versa. Uh, but personal effectiveness that we see at the top there applies to everyone. So we would recommend uh, when looking at the programme that everyone goes through the executive level at least, and then the managers and the leaders may split off into their individual uh, areas as, as, they, as they see fit. But the emphasis on um, all the, the on this programme is practical, and I will explain um, how this came about later on <clears throat> in the presentation. So we all know that we're in a changing world these days and the world has always changed. Business practices have always moved on, but particularly they've moved very quickly in the last year, mainly due to COVID. But there's more to it than that. And in, in many, for, for a long time now, online working has become more uh, acceptable. We've been able to reach a wider world more easily with connectivity. But COVID has accelerated this. And we are now in a situation where across the globe, people are working in teams, but, but remotely from each other uh, as, as a matter of, of, of norm, really. Um, and even uh, the experience we have at Scottish Chambers of Commerce is that all our trade missions now are delivered online. 
but they still have to be delivered to the same standards and the same expectations because the Scottish Government is funding these and expects us to, to deliver them properly. So the fact that things are happening online does not mean that they are of lower quality at all. Now, change is, is good and we, we can't stop it anyway, uh, but um, the problem is that it, it brings risks to, to those who do not adapt quickly enough and, and will fall behind. And some companies will fail um, uh, when, when we, as things move on. And some companies, uh, some very large companies in the UK here have failed already, household names that no longer exist. Why is that the case? Well, there are a number of reasons, but quite often it, it can be down to poor management. It can be complacency on the, in, on the part of the managers or the directors. And it can be resistance to change because not everybody likes change. People like things to be the same as they always were, the way that they have always understood it. But poor management and bullet point number four, lack of true leadership really causes employee disengagement. It means that good people, good people decide that perhaps this job is not for them anymore. And if, if you see in the bottom here, the sources AON Hewitt study, they carried out a study recently um, across 155 countries and 7 million people. So this is a very, very extensive survey indeed. And the one point to take away from this really is that uh, you can see that the sector for highly engaged um, top left is only 22%, just over one in five people who are actually high in, highly engaged with the company that they work for. And that's very disappointing indeed, because even if you add it to the moderately engaged, it, it's, it leaves a huge uh, number of uh, people who are, uh, not, don't care one way or the other, really, or are actively disengaged, even worse, actively disengaged people who are not buying into the company at all and would prefer to leave. And that is um, a failure of, of management that, 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 that this is allowed to, to happen. If only one in five of your workforce is highly engaged, then you're in a bad, bad situation. But employers don't tend to see that. Employers tend to believe uh, that their staff leave because they want more money. Uh, and in fact, that's not the case. The same survey that we just looked at, it showed that only 12% of people actually leave because the money isn't good enough. The real reason that they leave is they don't have that basic in motivation in them. They don't feel that they're bought into the company. They don't feel that they're valued and they think they could be better off somewhere else. So again, this is the responsibility of leaders and managers to, to address this. Now, I want to tell you a short story here um, just to illustrate. I like stories to try and illustrate things. If you just imagine for a minute that there were some scientists that wanted to um, experiment in how experiment in behavior. So they got five monkeys in a nature reserve. And these monkeys have collars on them that can deliver a very mild electric shock. It won't hurt them, but, but it's not, they don't like it. And the monkeys are fed every day with two baskets of food. There's a green basket and there's a red basket. And every time the monkeys go towards the red basket, they all get a mild electric shock. And even if only one of the monkeys goes towards that basket, they all get a mild electric shock. So of course, monkeys are intelligent, so they learn over time that they should really just go and eat from the green basket and leave the red basket alone. But what happens is if someone, if one of them forgets and goes towards the red basket, the other monkeys know they're going to get an electric shock. So they will pull him away, attack him or drag him off. So over time, uh, what happens is they all learn to eat out of the green basket. Then they take one of the monkeys away and they introduce a new monkey into the, into the group, which doesn't have a collar on him. So this new monkey is completely oblivious to the fact that he should only eat out, the green, eat out of the green basket. So when he goes to the red basket, the monkeys drag him off for the attack and so on. And over time, he learns, or she learns, if it's a human monkey, that um, they should not be eating out of the red basket. And this goes on. So one by one, they take out the monkeys with a collar and they bring in a new monkey without a collar. And the new monkey without the collar learns very quickly because other monkeys make it learn very quickly that it should only ever eat out the green basket. And eventually you get to the stage where the last monkey comes in and the, the last monkey that has a collar leaves the cage. A new monkey comes in and it, it, it also um, it gets forced into the same situation. 
But none of these monkeys, none of them have got a collar on them. None of them will ever get an electric shock. None of them have ever had an electric shock, but they've learned to eat out of the green basket because when the minute they were introduced to the nature reserve, that's the way that, they, that, that it was. And they got pulled up or attacked for doing anything differently. And that is applicable, I think, to a lot of companies. We bring people in, uh, we expect them to conform to the way that we work. We don't give them any opportunities to grow or ask questions. They learn the job but they learn it the way that it's always been done and it might not be the best way of doing it. And so if we really want to progress, we have to allow people to, to, to question and we have to question our own practices and procedures, even if we've been doing them for years, why do we do it this way? Is there a good reason for it? Or is it just the fact that that's the way it's always been done so we, we won't change? And the companies that won't change will not succeed. Now, there are a number of ways that we, we you know we can um, encourage people to uh, develop more and, and, and come up with great good ideas and so on. And one of these, um, one of the thing I was about to mention to you is something that's known as the Johari window. And the first time I heard of this, I thought it sounded like very mystical Eastern Johari, but in actual fact, it's, it was invented by two uh, US professors called Joe and Harry. So it's not, it's not that <laughs> um, mystical at all. And what we're looking at here is we're looking, we're imagining someone's um, abilities and capabilities and we're looking down on a house with the roof removed so this is the plan of the house and it has four rooms the outside walls of the house uh, which contains all the personality traits the box if you like um, are, are glass so you can see in but the internal walls are actually made of brick they're solid so you can't see through them now when we're looking at uh, ourselves we imagine our own personality we look at it from one one perspective other people look at us through their experiences with us from another perspective. So what can they see? Well, when we're looking into the, the box and we look at our own personalities, we can see into box one and so can other people because we can see through the glass, but we can't see through. So we can both see into box one. That's our open self. That's the things that we know about ourselves and that other people see in us as well. And everybody's agreed in that. You could be outgoing, you'd be a, you know, a nice, friendly person, easygoing, that's the thing. You know that, other people know that. But other people will see things about you that you can't see because they're looking at it from a different perspective. These are the things that maybe the abilities that you have got that you don't recognize you could bring to the table. It or maybe sometimes it could be negative. It could be the way that you behave puts other people off. You don't see that, but they do. Not going to spend much time in box three because this is really uh, aspects of your characteristics that nobody knows. And it's the kind of thing that would you run into a burning building to save somebody? You don't know that until it happens and neither does anyone else. But the, the box four is interesting because this is the one, the box that only you can see and other people don't see. And this can often, for example, be a situation where um, people think that you're very confident and outgoing and you're, you're you know, very, very, very capable but you yourself might know that you are nervous uh, or that perhaps you don't like public speaking. Other people don't see that in you. Now, there are, um, we can't do this today because we don't have time, but there are exercises that you can go through as a group where you can bring out the, the thoughts of, of, that you have yourself confidentially and that other people see in you. And the good thing that comes out of these exercises when we do them regularly is that people are surprised by box two, they're surprised about the, the things that other people see in them that are good that they could bring to the table and they, they haven't worked on it. They don't know that. But it's also good sometimes for other people, if this person is willing to share it, to see, you know, to understand what the person themselves is concerned about or feels is, is drawing them back. And doing the, working together like that, it means that people can improve and improve themselves and improve the team and benefit everyone. So we need to develop our interpersonal skills. We have to work together instead of against each other if we want to achieve more. I suppose we've all seen that acronym team together, everyone achieves more. Everyone achieves more. But we have to, we have to do this in, in, the, in the modern world. It's more important ever than ever now, the way that we work, that we, we hone our interpersonal skills. So we need to know uh, and understand what, what people's uh, characteristics are like and how, how people would tend to behave. 
And so what I'm going to show you now over the next few slides um, is just a, a, an illustration of the different types of personalities, the different types of social styles that people tell, tend to fall into. Now, I'm going to be using four um, descriptions here, friend, actor, thinker, driver. These are not thought up by me. These are accepted uh, across leadership and management training across the world. So when people talk about someone being a friend or green, trainers will know what they mean. I'm going to go through this now, so you, you'll get to see what I mean. But people do tend to fall into four character, types of, uh, of social style for most of the time. Now, we can all move between them at different times in our lives and in different situations, but essentially, people will either be will fall into either a friend, which is the kind of amiable person, the one that is relates to people, the one that is concerned about others. We all know these, these people that we, that we work with who are good, team players, we like being with them, they are friendly and helpful. Actors, or yellows, tend to be quite expressive and very socialising, and salespeople tend to be like this. Um, so they're, they're, they're out there, they're, they tend to um, express their emotions very easily and, and uh, they're not afraid to say what, what they think in a good sense. Thinkers, though, are the analytical people who, um, and I'm not trying to box people here, but if you imagine an accountant, for example, would be would expect to be a thinker and be analytical, otherwise they wouldn't be very good at their job. Um, and a driver would tend to be someone who is um, a doer or a director, someone that gets things done, makes decisions. Now, the two at the top, the friend and the actor, they tend to be people orientated. So they're more interested in, in, in activities that involve working with people. Whereas the two down the bottom, mm. thinker and driver, tend, but not always, but tend to be people who are task orientated. So they'll be more interested in getting the task done. And of course they could be interested in people, but it's the task that's driving them, not necessarily the engagement with people. People on the left, the amiable friend and the analytical thinker, tend to be slower in making decisions for different reasons, because the analytical person wants to test everything. But the friendly person sometimes can make it, be, be, sometimes can um, not be very focused on making decisions quickly. So they, they'll take the time around things. The actors, the sales type people, and the, the directors tend to want to get things done quickly. They're driving ahead. Now, if we don't understand in a team or, or even in our business negotiations, who we are dealing with, if, what kind of, social style that the person we're dealing with has, then we're likely to deal with them in the wrong way. So we may be asking an analytical person to make a quick decision, or we may be expecting a director to, you know, to, to, to think about things for a long time. And if we don't approach them the right way, then we're not going to get the results that, that or we're not going to get positive results from them. So the friendly people, the, 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 the greens, they tend to, you know, be caring, sharing, patient and relaxed. The outgoing actor of people, social, expressive, persuasive, motivating. The thinkers are analytical, precise. They question things. They will double check everything as they should. And a, a, a director or a driver is usually determined, normally competitive and strong-willed, and would like to think of themselves as an achiever um, if, 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 if indeed they, you know, they are successful. But there are some downsides as well, not necessarily negative traits, but uh, things that we need to be aware of, is that um, the friend people can, can sometimes be a bit, as I mentioned, disengaged and have no priorities. So they, they need to focus sometimes to make a decision. The outgoing people, the, the sales folk, can, sometimes, can easily get bored and they can be disruptive if they're not happy with the way things are going. They don't listen very well all the time. Once they've said what they've said, they have a tendency to stop. And they can be flamboyant, but sometimes not have a great deal of substance behind that. The problem with dealing with thinkers is sometimes that they can avoid decisions and they can appear to be a bit reserved and cold. They're not really necessarily being like that. They are simply taking their time to, to make a, a correct decision, but it can be frustrating sometimes to deal with people who won't make a quick decision. And of course, directors and people like that, it can be demanding, controlling, aggressive, impatient and dominant. So in terms of leadership and management, we need to be aware of these traits and we need to be aware of the people that we're dealing with and interact with them accordingly. So what is the difference between a leader and a manager? Well. Um, there are, as I said, there are common, common traits, but essentially a leader will instigate change and the manager will try to maintain stability after that, that has happened. 
the leader tends to have a longer term vision and the manager will have short, short to medium term objectives normally. A leader is more inclined to take risks because they're looking ahead at new ideas. And the manager's job is to reduce these risks once the courses of action start to take, take place. So a manager will follow what the leader is, is doing, but will try to reduce the risks as, they, as they're performing. Leaders tend to be driven by their heart, um, they, by what they think. Um, and here, I mean, you know, what they, what they feel, I should say, what they feel. Whereas managers tend to be driven by their head, so they'll make conscious decisions about things that are more thought out. Uh, and leaders tend to have uh, to, to take people with them on the journey, but through their charisma, whereas managers take people with them through the authority that they have. So there is a difference. And some people are very good at both, but quite often you'll find people who are good leaders don't make good managers, and people who are good managers are not necessarily the best leaders.